Um, who is here for the first time? We're happy to welcome you and of course all of our returning Cal students. So I do, I am going to read a little bit from this sheet because there's a lot of things that I need to remember to say and I want to make sure that I actually say all of them. So the organizing committee of Skeptical is the Bay Area Skeptics and the Sacramento Area Skeptics. I live in Davis, so I'm part of the Sacramento Area Skeptics. Um, all of us have name tags, and while it may not be super prominent, the Bay Area Skeptics or the Sac Skeptics logos are on our name tags, and anybody who has that logo, you can ask us questions. If that person is running around doing something, maybe find someone else. They might be busy. Um, a couple of the things about this room today. There is a camera in the back, because we will be recording. So it's in this corner over there. Make sure not to walk in front of it. You do need to get up while it's in the room. The other thing is, the restrooms we're using are actually in the hotel. And we would like to ask you to go back out to the sidewalk and back into the hotel to use the restroom, rather than going this way, right past the speakers. The speaker is the person who should be the focus of attention. And if you're walking back this way, people are maybe going to be focusing on you. Um, okay. So today, we're only in this room. So all of the plenaries will be right in here, so you won't have to go to a different room. They'll all be in here. The exhibitors are also all in this room. So you'll be in one place. And so I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what you're in store for today. you also have a schedule, hopefully, in your folder. So the first plenary will start with Eugenia Scott. And she's going to be talking about science and pseudoscience of race. Following Jeannie will be Marty Klein, who will discuss porn literacy and the real impacts of pornography on public health. The last morning plenary will be given by Ed Wasserman on the very timely subject of fake news. Dr. Wasserman will help us identify truth in media. The lunch break today will go from 12.30 to 2, and then the afternoon plenaries will start with Andrew Fracknoy, who will enlighten us on eclipse myths and prepare us for the all-American solar eclipse coming up in August. Following him, we'll have Judith Horseman, who will help us dispel some myths about the brain, including that really popular one that we only use 10% of it. <laughs> and then our final plenary will be given by Brian Dunn. And Brian will help us challenge assumptions by deconstructing so-called skeptical explanations in the media of popular phenomena. The final, well, throughout the day we'll have two performances. So there are a lot of places to go get lunch here in Berkeley, so you can go get lunch and pretty quickly come back, and Joey Fabian will be performing during the lunch hour. And then after that, at the end of the day, we're happy to welcome Luigi Enzivino with a performance on the magic of science. And the conference today will end at 6. So also in that folder that you got, uh, you have your schedule, again, very important. But there is also a way to provide feedback on your experience. So there's a hard copy survey that you can do, but this year you can also fill out that survey electronically. So please see that sheet because we really look forward to hearing how you felt about it. And then, uh, let's see. If you're a tweeter, be sure to use the hashtag SkepticalCon. Note that there's no free Wi-Fi here, with apologies. Um, and just generally, we hope you enjoy the conference. We're all very excited about the speakers, and we hope that you are too. And with that, I have the very distinct pleasure of getting to introduce Dr. Eugene Scott. So for many of you, probably, Dr. Scott doesn't really need an introduction, but I'm going to give one anyway, so you can listen to me for just a couple more minutes. Jeannie is well known in the skeptic community for her efforts at the National Center for Science Education to oppose the teaching of creationism and climate science denial. Among other recognitions, she has received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and the Skeptic of the Year Award from the Skeptic Society. Asteroid 149540, Eugenie Scott, has been named after her. And she promises it's not aimed at the Earth. Today, in her talk, she's going back to her roots as a biological anthropologist who taught the subject of human variation and race at the university level for many years. Please welcome Eugenie Scott to speak on the science.
Good morning. And thank you, Lauren, very much. Uh, as Lauren said, when I was a college professor, I taught a course for many years called Human Variation and Race. And much of what I'm going to be talking about this morning um, reflects the perspective of physical or biological anthropology. This is, after all, the discipline that deals more with the concept of human race than just about any other discipline. But the concept of race is a biological concept. It's used by many biologists under certain research conditions. It is a useful term to study certain problems in biology. Yet it's the issue of human races that causes the most trouble. But the topic of race within biology itself, even when applied to non-humans, is problematic. Bioanthropologists and other biologists tend not to use the word race, even for those research problems where carefully defined it might be appropriate. It's for the same reason, quite honestly, that I don't use the word theory when I talk about science to in the general public. I talk about explanations, scientific explanations. I don't use the T word because what the public hears when I say theory is not what I mean as a scientist. Similarly, the word race to a biologist or to a biological anthropologist is not what the public hears. So we're better off not using it, using a term like population or group. <clears throat> so, what is race? Well, in 1924, Virginia passed the Racial Integrity Act. This was intended to prevent non-whites from attending white schools. No one with any degree of racial admixture could be considered white and therefore go to public schools. Um, this is the one-drop rule, as they call it. But this ran into problems because there were quite a few, and that's speaking of problems, um, is it going to just come back again? By spontaneously uh, combusting you? All right. Many prominent Virginians reckon some ancestry from Pocahontas. So the Pocahontas rule was invoked to allow up to 1 16th of Indian ancestry, but no other non-white ancestry was allowed. So what does it mean to be white? These are Pamunkey Indians who have a reservation that goes back to 1646 in the state of Virginia. They have recently been recognized by the federal government as an Indian tribe, and this comes with a number of educational and medical and other advantages. You can have casinos, you can um, cigarette taxes and liquor taxes. There's a number of things that are useful about being a recognized Indian tribe. They don't appear to have any linguistic or cultural association with uh, any other American Indian group. The Congressional Black Caucus objected to their receiving this federal recognition because their, the Pamunkey Constitution until 19, excuse me, until 2012 forbade any enrolled member of the tribe from intermarriage with African Americans. They would kick you out of the tribe for that. These are Lumbees. Lumbees are a large group of over 50,000 people in Robeson County, North Carolina, who are currently seeking federal recognition as an Indian tribe. They claim to be descendants of the Cheraw tribe and have been recognized by the state of North Carolina as Indians since 1885. They were previously classified as, quote, free persons of color. Now, although there are, no claim, there are some claims for a Lumbee dialect of Southern English, there are no linguistic connections to Indian languages, nor rituals, or any other cultural connections. There's a fascinating history of groups like the Lumbees and Pamunkeys, mostly through the Southeast and Southern United States, some in the Midwest. They're usually small populations, unlike the Lumbees, who are rather large, most of whom date back to the 19th century, and, and some even earlier. Their ancestors often settled in frontier areas and consisted of escaped slaves and white settlers with some American Indian ancestry, what geneticists have called triracial isolates. After the Civil War, and you know, given the problems with Reconstruction and Jim Crow laws, many of them, um, the vast majority of them, claimed to be white, or as with the Pamunkey and Lumbees, they claimed to be Indian. So what does it mean to be Indian? Walter Francis White was the head of the NAACP from the 1930s to the 1950s and was a prominent and effective civil rights leader. He was blue-eyed, blonde-haired, and had fair skin. 
Both of his parents had been born just before the Civil War and had been born into slavery. He wrote, quote, I am a Negro. My skin is white, my eyes are blue, my hair is blonde. The traits of my race are nowhere visible upon me. He was able to use his appearance to go undercover to research lynchings, race riots, and racial murders. Rachel Dolezal was head of the Spokane NAACP in 2014 and 2015. She also has blue eyes and black hair and fair skin. Police conducted a background check after numerous unsubstantiated complaints she had made about Rachel Harrisman and discovered that her parents were both white. Mrs. Dolezal's parents claimed Swedish, German, and Czech ancestry. Several African-American organizations criticized Ms. Dolezal of engaging in blackface. So what does it mean to be black? The United States census categories include race, white, black, Native American, and so forth. They also include ethnicity, in this example, Hispanic and non-Hispanic. Uh, by the way, an example of a, of a black Hispanic is Soledad O'Brien's mother, who's an Afro-Cuban. So what does it mean for Rachel Dolezal or Walter Francis White to be African American? What does it mean to be Indian? What does it mean to be white? Can you decide to be a member of a race? What do Americans mean when they talk about race? Is it biological? Is it national? Is it linguistic? Is it cultural? I once, actually several times, asked freshman anthropology classes to give me examples of races. Students would give me colors, black, white, yellow. Uh, they'd give me geographies, um, Caucasian, African Asian. They'd also write some curious comments like intelligent or criminal and the ever popular human. More than once, students wrote down Christian. I think it's pretty safe to say that the word race is not well defined. It means a lot of different things to different people. From these examples and others, race includes many features, some of them contradictory. Included are biology, cultural, national origin, social classifications, and even religious differences. I don't have 15 weeks, I have 15 minutes. I'm going to have to make this briefer. So I'm going to concentrate today on the biological issues. Um, this is not to say that the cultural and social issues are unimportant. Arguably, if race is nothing else, it is cultural and social. But first, let's turn to biology. The common understanding of race is that it's got something to do with biology. Races are thought to be types of people that differ in appearance, skin color, but also other physical features, like the constellation of features that make up the face, eye shape, uh, nose um, uh, shape, uh, the degree of prognathism or uh, extension of the face below the eyes, and so forth. Uh, but also things like body proportions. The Inuit from northern Canada and Nilots from Sudan have quite different proportions of legs and arms to the torso, for example. Human beings certainly do vary. They vary from individual to individual. And the question is, do populations of humans vary as well, and in what way? Well, obviously, populations of, of human beings vary as well, but it all depends on how you delimit it. Race is also thought of as having something to do with geography. In fact, geography is baked into our definitions and our use of the word race. We talk about Africans or Caucasians or American Indians or Pacific Islanders. This map from the United States Census reflects a, if you will, a pre-1492 map of human groups. Now, obviously, there's been a lot of movement of people on the planet, especially since the 1500s and the age of European exploration. South America, for example, has a large influx of Europeans, even if it has a large Native American population. And of course, in South and Central America and the Caribbean, there's a very large proportion of the populations that are mixed American Indian, African, and European. Yet, even with all the population movement that has taken place since the 1500s, most people would recognize these continental races, as they're sometimes called. Now, of course, these are not homogeneous. Um, West Africans look quite different from Africans from the Horn of Africa, look quite different from Africans in North Africa, the, the, uh, the Sahara. But these groupings would also uh, reflect geography. 
So most Americans associate race with geography in some fashion or another. Also quite common is the view that races are discrete or bounded units, separate from other such units, at least at some previous time, maybe before 1500. There's also the assumption that races are unchanging, that they are stable or permanent entities. It assumes that if you saw Africans a thousand or five thousand years ago, they would look pretty much like Africans today. Europeans have always looked like Europeans and so forth. Races also thought of as being a characteristic of individuals, that most Americans think individuals can be placed into one race or another. Related to the idea of races being discrete units, is the idea that races on some level are viewed as being pure, that they are unmixed. Many people rank races as superior or advanced versus backward and uh, inferior. This idea of the ranking of races, I believe, started with a medieval idea called the great chain of being. All of nature was thought to be rankable, from minerals through animals to humans to angels to God. In the 1700s and 1800s, this view was refined, as it were, by ranking races within the human category. Of course, it mattered considerably who was doing the ranking. <laughs> if Europeans were doing the ranking, <laughs> this is obviously somebody who's never seen an American Indian, but never mind. If Europeans were doing the rankings, of course Europeans were on top. And within Europeans, Germans put Germans on top, English put English on top, and so forth and so on. Of course, the Japanese and the Chinese thought that all the Westerners were barbarians who smelled bad, and they have their own uh, rankings as well. Finally, there are strong beliefs that race is correlated with behaviors. Many people believe that racial groups have intelligence and temperament differences, and that these are biologically based. They look at differences between the averages or means of scores and IQ tests among whites, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and conclude that these differences correlate with biological differences among these groups. So to what degree do any of these American concepts about race are supported by science, and to what degree are they contradicted by science? And after looking at the science, which is what I'm going to do next, what can we say about the concept of race in human beings? Well, if you're going to understand the biology of race, there are three categories of information you have to understand. Heredity, evolution, and population structure. I am going to inflict some science upon you. Um, let's start with heredity, because if race means anything, uh, characteristics have to be passed down from generation to generation. So I'm assuming this is a well-educated group. You understand the basics of Mendelian inheritance. I don't have to go into the, any of this in great detail, but you know, obviously Mendel did not know what a gene was, but he knew that something was passed down. And whatever it was, it stayed separate, generation through generation. Heredity is particulate, does not blend. Mendel also knew that the hereditary units were paired, and that the pairs split or segregated into sperm and egg. Mendel also recognized that the hereditary units were independent of, them, of one another. The principle of independent assortment says that characteristics like the color of a pea flower or the, um, surf, the shape of a pea flower are passed down independent of one another, which actually is not strictly true because of length genes, but never mind. You didn't get everything right. When fertilization occurs, the hereditary units recombine and the offspring have from each parent. Each generation then, genes separate, they get mixed up, and they recombine to form new and unique organisms differ from their parents. So you get half your genes from your mother and half your genes from your father, but you have no control over which half. Um, you only get half your genes, and there's no guarantee it's going to be the ones you want. It means that sometimes people who raise racehorses or dogs or plants are quite disappointed when the greatness of the parent is not visited on the offspring. The great racehorse Secretariat is an example of this. He was considered one of the greatest thoroughbreds that ever lived. What a magnificent athlete he was. Some of his records still stand after 40 years. Um, as a sire, he did produce a lot of winners. Interesting, his daughters, sire, his daughters 
uh, buttered a lot of fast horses, such as the nature of genetic roulette. Stuff is passed down, but it gets mixed up pretty quickly due to the nature of heredity. I recall my father coming to visit shortly after my daughter was born. My mother-in-law was also visiting. When Carrie started crying, my dad quipped to my mother, those are your 25%. <laughs> Carrie has half my genes, and I have half my father's genes, half my mother's genes. That means my daughter, my daughter's genes are 25% from each of her four grandparents. Similarly, your grandchild will carry 25% uh, of your genes. Your great-grandchildren will carry only 12.5% of your genes. Your great-great-grandchildren will carry only 6.25% of your genes. And by the time you get down to your third great-grandchild, you're talking about only 3% of your genes getting through. So just from the nature of heredity, just from simple genetics, the notion that there's going to be any stability or purity of biology through time is just not going to happen. It's not something you'd expect and it's not something you'd get. Heredity is dynamic. But genes are only part of it. What we observe in people, animals, or plants is called the phenotype. These two animals have a lot of similarity in coat pattern. But the genes that produce the calico, cat and, uh, calico coat in cats easy for you to say. And the blue merle coloring in dogs are very different. Well, yeah, you'd expect that because dogs are very different from cats, but it was such a great picture I had to show you. <laughs> but they're really cute. Yeah. But it is possible to have the same phenotype and have different genotypes. The genotype being the actual genetic composition for the trait, the phenotype the observable result. Smooth peas can occur phenotypically with different genotypes, you all know this. So variation can be hidden in the genes and not emerge every generation or even maybe for several generations. Within the population's gene pool, variation can be carried for generations without expression. Now traits associated with color and size are examples of more than one gene or allele affecting a trait, what's called polygenic inheritance. Coat color and golden retrievers shows intermediates between the homozygous extremes as a result of the interaction of three genes. Actually, golden retrievers have the same genes for coat color as black labs, but they have two other genes that their effects added together provide this very, very pale coat versus down to the dark mahogany coat. <clears throat> Human skin color is also polygenic with several genes affecting melanin production and expression, and other genes that affect reddish qualities to the phenotype. A person's color depends on what combination of these genes is inherited and how much time they spend in the sun. I once spent a, a couple of summers on the Hopi Indian Reservation, and one of our friends, my husband and my friends, was a Hopi man who um, worked uh, indoors. Uh, he wore um, a suit coat, and he wore long pants every day, and we were having dinner one night, and he happened to cross his legs, and his pants, uh, pant leg rose up on his cap, and his skin color was very, very light. And I was just stunned, and then he realized, oh yeah, that part doesn't get tanned. So skin color is a result of environmental as well as uh, genetic factors, but we're just talking about genes here. A person's color depends on what combination of these genes is inherited. Assuming two parents that are heterozygous, by normal genetic reduction divisions, they would produce sperm and eggs with varying amount of genes for melanin production. There won't be a quiz, don't worry. Um, the result of recombination of these genes carried in sperm and eggs is shown in this fairly complicated chart. Um, I think you can see that with additive genes like polygenic traits, you can get a lot of variation depending on the assortment of genes in the sperm and eggs. Two pale parents are by probability are going to have mostly pale children. Two very dark parents have a higher probability of having very dark children. But two parents who are intermediate in color, if you look at the middle of that chart, they're going to produce children, if you can see when the chart comes back, uh, they're going to produce children that are, would have a, quite a wide range of uh, color possibilities. <clears throat> now this chart is actually a simplification. There's more than three genes and two alleles each, but imagine how big this sort of grand planet square would be if they put all the genes in. So this is just a teaching. 
In 2005, Kylie and Remy Hodgson, fraternal twins, were born to mixed race parents in Nottingham, England. The genes carried by the parents can combine in ways that produce a wide variety of phenotypes. The probability is low that a very light or very dark child would be produced, but not vanishingly so. We just notice it more when they're born at the same time. Here's the little girls at seven, they're still making you. The daughters of Viviana and Dennis Ng in California similarly show the effects of genetic recombination that are not surprising from parents whose ancestry is Irish, African American, Hawaiian, and Chinese. <laughs> Such intermarriage has gone on for quite a long time. Statistically, people tend to marry parents whose ancestry is, excuse me, people tend to marry others who resemble them phenotypically. Some of the children of Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson took their genes into the white gene pool. Some of them took their genes into the black gene pool. So genes from Africa and genes from Europe don't stay put, which certainly challenges the idea of purity or fixity of races. There's one more point I want to make about phenotype. By the way, if you're sitting next to an empty seat, would you please raise your hand? Keep them up for just a moment. There's a lot of empty seats there. Those of you standing in the back, keep them up for just a little longer, please. Let those people find a place to sit, because otherwise, their legs will get tired. Thank you. When we look at a trait like stature, it's clear that part of the variation we see is genetic, especially at the extremes of the range. Um, if you are over seven feet tall or you're less than three feet tall, clearly you have genes that differ from the average person. But outside of those extremes, genes interact with the environment to produce a phenotype. In Europe, the average stature of males has increased more than four inches over the last century. It's highly unlikely that there have been substantial changes in genes for stature in Europe in only 100 years. But we know there have been substantial changes in both nutrition and health. Those are environmental factors. Especially for polygenic traits. Genes provide for a range of phenotypes and environmental factors can have substantial contributions to the eventual phenotype. So in addition to knowing about heredity, um, you also need to know that living sh things share common ancestors and that adap adaptation occurs. We're going to talk a little bit about evolution. Here's the relationship between heredity, adaptation, and evolution. This is evolution 101 on one slide, okay? <clears throat> Here's a population. Populations consist of individuals. Individuals are not identical. They vary in a variety of ways depending on what the species is. This was a population of rabbits, for example. Uh, some of them might have longer ears than others. Some of them might have thicker coats than others. There could be biochemical differences that allow some of these rabbits to withstand um, uh, viruses or, or bacteria better than other rabbits. So there's going to be variation within this population of rabbits, which will apparently return at some point. <clears throat> now the variation within that population is produced every generation by a variety of genetic factors, some of which we've talked about very briefly. Your basic Mendelian <coughs> uh, kinds of recombination, uh, uh, mutation, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. But, and that's a good thing, because all populations need variation to be able to handle the challenges of an environment. All populations live in an environment or, or, or more than one. And there are stresses, there are challenges posed by environments. Heat or um, cold or altitude or uh, dampness or dryness or um, uh, diseases or predation. So there's all kinds of pressures that act upon any population of organisms. So what happens every generation is the variation within the population responds to these environmental pressures through evolutionary processes like natural selection. So what happens when every generation genetic variation emerges in a population and every generation a population has to adjust to environmental factors, what happens? Change. Carry on this change, generation after generation, run this through time, and you get evolution. Evolution is the natural result of heredity and adaptation. Let's talk about population structure. 
At the bottom of the population hierarchy is the individuals. So with polit and I'm not going to talk about individuals. For our purposes, they're really not very important. Sorry, Sheldon, another psychologist, but you know, we'll have to cope with this. Next comes the local interbreeding population, what biologists call a deem. These are groups of individuals who have a high probability of choosing their mates from other members of the population. Now, deems tend to be bio, uh, geographically conscribed, uh, circumscribed, excuse me. A field mouse is much more likely to choose a mate from a field mouse within 100 yards than from a field mouse that lives a mile away. Field mice, by the way, have very small ranges. Animals with very large ranges, like uh, wolves or mountain lions, their, um, their deem can extend over literally thousands of acres. Sometimes the geography, though, is on your side. If, you're, if you are a biologist and you're studying a uh, population of frogs within a, on a peninsula that's surrounded by water, you got your deem. But generally speaking, it's really hard to circumscribe where a deem begins and ends because, of course, they're open genetic groups and individuals will move in and out of teams. So the deem is not a crisp category by any stretch of the imagination. So not all deems are definable, and not all individuals can be placed into a deem. A subspecies or race, in the biological sense, is a group of deems sharing a geographic area and sharing phenotypic characteristics. If you are a birder, if you are a bird watcher, you hear a lot about races and subspecies because they talk about them all the time. Uh, peregrine falcons belong to the species species Falcus peregrinus, and in North America they're divided into three subspecies. They're in different geographic areas, they differ phenotypically, they can interbreed because they're all part of the same species, but they don't interbreed because generally speaking they uh, are, they don't have, most of the time they don't have overlapping ranges. Heart of beasts, giraffes, wolves, wild turkeys, lots and lots of species of animals form subspecies over their ranges. Let's talk about species. Species consists of all of the organisms that can produce viable, fertile offspring. So deems and subspecies and individual comprise species. Now usually it's pretty easy to tell species apart. Uh, they're quite different and they don't interbreed. <laughs> there are a lot of good species. Cats don't interbreed with dogs and much as it pains me to say it, there is no crocodile. <laughs> but it's not always easy to define, to identify a species if that definition is viable fertile offspring. Horses and donkeys can breed and produce viable offspring, but we still classify them as separate species because mules are sterile. Actually, the equids, the horse family, can swap genes around to a surprising amount. It's also possible to cross zebras and horses and zebras and donkeys. Now, the reason why horses and donkeys and zebras can interbreed is that evolution happened, which brings us to the issue of speciation. How do you get new species? Speciation is the separation of populations into groups that don't reproduce with one another. So species A may change through time, let's call it A prime or A prime prime. The usual reasons, um, you know, I mean, excuse me, pardon me, got lost here. But it's also possible for lineage to split. The usual reasons for such splitting are geographic. The population gets isolated by changing geography. A, a river or stream changes uh, position and that cuts them off from other members of their population or a mountain chain can go up or the Sahara can become dry. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why geography can split populations. If population A prime gets separated from the rest of the species, if it's not exchanging genes, it can diverge. If isolating mechanisms arise, it won't be possible to exchange genes with the rest of the parent species. Now, isolating mechanisms are really the key to understanding speciation. Isolating mechanisms can be a variety of things. They can be chromosomal. It could be that the chromosomes don't line up properly. Um, interestingly enough, it's not so much the number of chromosomes, but what's on them. Uh, it could be a behavioral uh, isolating mechanism. It could be that um, the birds don't respond to the uh, other population's mating calls. Uh, it could be an ecological isolating mechanism. It could be that they breed at different times of the year. So they're not exchanging genes. So there's a lot of reasons 
why um, isolated groups like this could diverge in ways that would make it impossible for them to exchange genes back with the, the former population. And over time, you might end up with new species. <clears throat> This is why horses, zebras, and donkeys can produce viable, if not fertile, offspring. Horses, donkeys, and zebras, before domestication, of the first two of them anyway, occupy different geographies. All of them are grazers, but zebras and horses favored plains environments and donkeys' foothills. Zebras evolved in Africa, horses in North America, and donkeys in the Southwest Asian foothills. These species are able to interbreed because evolution was incomplete. The process of speciation was interrupted by domestication. Here's another example. Lions and tigers <clears throat> occupy similar ecological niches. They are cats who focus on stalking large prey, but they evolved in different geographies. Lions in Africa, tigers in Asia. Remember all those Tarzan movies with the tigers? No. <laughs> you can either be Tarzan of the apes in Africa, or Tarzan of the Tigers in Asia, because there aren't any tigers in Africa, okay? Lions and tigers probably evolved from a common ancestor that originally inhabited available territory across a wide range, somewhere in a wide range of Africa and Asia. Climate changes, continental movements reduce the ability of African <coughs> and Asian populations to exchange genes, and the populations began to diverge. Today, we consider African lions and Asian tigers to be separate species because they don't exchange genes in the wild. But in captivity, they can. A liger is the offspring of a lion male and a tiger female. A tigon is the offspring of a male tiger and a female lion, and you've got to be totally nuts to do this. <laughs> Fertility is decreased with these hybrid cats. But some of them have apparently been able to back cross to one of the parents. Again, incomplete speciation. Evolution was interrupted. <laughs> no pun intended. We belong to the species Homo sapiens sapiens, and our closest relative is Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. The third name is a subspecific name. These two species had largely independent evolutionary histories after diverging from a common ancestor about 500,000 years ago. The lineage leading to modern humans evolved in Europe, the lineage, excuse me, evolved in Africa, the lineage leading to Neanderthals evolved in Europe. They were geographically, special, special, geographically separated and they began to diverge genetically. About 50,000 years ago, these populations came back together again. And they did start to interbreed and they did manage to exchange genes. Not very many here. Uh, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens sapiens had apparently diverged sufficiently so that there was not a great deal of interchange among them, at least as judged by uh, the amount of genetic variation from Neanderthals in modern humans, which I think is kind of cool. I'm actually rather disappointed in not being more Neanderthal, but you know, you, got, you, you do what you can. Uh, evolution was interrupted. Speciation was incomplete, but almost so. Okay, so what's the takeaway here? Species cannot interbreed, okay? But anything within a species can. The big ovals are subspecies within a species, the little hearts are deems in the subspecies. Well, we're talking about sex, right? So, you know, I'm gonna use little hearts. Uh, I, I was thinking of using stars, but not everybody has great sex. And anyway, <laughs> and anyway the pornography talk is later on, so. <laughs> Deems within a common geographic range are more likely to exchange genes, just because of propinquity. That's a no-brainer. But because subspecies are open genetic systems, members of deems from different subspecies can interbreed and share genes, and do. Now, it's more likely that subspecies on the margins of the ranges of a subspecies are going to interbreed, because subspecies do have this geographical component to them. Peregrine subspecies in Alaska are more likely to exchange genes than they are to exchange genes with peregrine subspecies in British Columbia, just because they live more closely together. Now note also that not all genes can be placed into a subspecies. Subspecies, you remember, are rather arbitrary geographical groupings. 
and not all deemed show the geographical and morphological similarity we associate with the subspecies. Okay, here's what you have to remember. Anything below the level of the species is an open genetic system. The large hearts represent deems, the small hearts represent individuals. Here's where we really get into it. By definition, individuals within the local breeding population can and do interbreed. And because deems are open genetic systems, members of deems can breed with and exchange genes with members of other groups. Anything below the level of species is an open genetic system. Stuff is going to pass around. One more concept relevant to the understanding of race from a scientific point of view. Again, populations, geography, and gen genes. And that's the question of how are genetic traits distributed across a geographical area. A very common pattern is clinal variation. And a cline is a gradient of a trait across a geographical area. One of the best known clines or gradients is that of skin color in Eurasia which decreases with distance from the equator. And of course, this is related to ultraviolet radiation, and it's a real challenge at the, at the uh, equator. People have dark skin near the equator as a way of protecting their skin against UV radiation. The further you get from the equator, the less the UV radiation challenge, but also the greater the challenge of getting enough vitamin D. And one of the sources of vitamin D is through uh, through your skin. Your skin can manufacture vitamin D uh, uh, through, through the aspect of sunlight. So there's this gradient of skin color in Eurasia. But notice that there's not a sharp border between these shades, if you will. It's a continuous distribution. Here's another clinal distribution, another gradient over a geographical area, type B of the ADO blood group in Europe. The highest frequencies of type B blood are in Central Asia, and they decline the closer you get to uh, Western Europe. This may be a reflection of the invasion of Europe by Central Asians after the, in the Middle Ages and beyond. I mean, people do leave their genes behind, right? You notice that the cline in skin color, which goes north and south, doesn't match the cline in blood group, which goes east and west. Um, they are discordant. Human variation doesn't take the form of discontinuous populations that vary uh, from others. Because of heredity and evolution, the genetic traits of populations usually are distributed clinally. Discordance of traits occurs so often that biologists get kind of suspicious of the race concept. How can you have a bounded group if the traits characterizing the group don't vary together? <clears throat> okay, what does all this tell us about the concept of race? It tells us that a lot of the things we thought about race aren't supported by science. Let's go back to that list that we started out with. There certainly are biological differences between individual human beings and even among groups of humans. If you parachuted into Nairobi, you would know you did not parachute into Tenochtitlan. Right? Y'all know where that is, right? <laughs> Mesoamerican Aztecs? Okay. <laughs> you probably wouldn't have parachuted into either of these places in 1492, but never mind. It's just an example. Similarly, human variation has geographical components as well. And again, think 1492. The frequencies of various blood groups, and again, this is B and the ABO group, they differ strongly by geography, and this reflects evolutionary principles of migration, boundary effect, and natural selection. But is this geographic human variation organized into something we can call races? Not if race means what most people think it means. Are races discrete entities? Are races bounded groups? Well, the notion that races are discrete groupings is an artifact of looking only at the nodes and not at the continua of biological variation. Most African Americans are descended from people who came here from a relatively restricted area of West Africa in the 1700s and 1800s. Most Asian Americans are descended from people who came here from East Asia during the 1800s and 1900s. Most European Americans come from Europe, which is, after all, a rather small proportion of the Eurasian landmass. 
So this idea that we have in this country of three major races is partly a sampling problem. We're sampling nodes where the reality is human variation is distributed continuously, not discreetly. Here's another way to think about it. If races were discrete entities, geographically limited groups of teams, then over a wide geographic area, we should see discrete clusters of variation. Race A gives way to race B, gives way to race C, etc., etc. But actually, if you looked at the distribution of traits, most of them are continuous. And we've seen the skin color and body proportion, facial features like eye and nose shape, and so forth and so on. If the numbers in this list of, that I just made up were different frequencies of genes in the populations, sampling populations side by side would reveal a continuum or climb, not discrete races. This is because genes are open genetic systems. You're all going to go home and get that tattoo, right? I mean, open genetic systems, this is something that you will take away from this talk. And because genes flow from individual to individual, from deem to deem, um, within a species, there are no discrete races. So no, races are not discrete. Are races stable or permanent? Well, not if they're biological. Both the nature of heredity and the fact of evolution mitigate against any group of populations remaining unchanged over time. Natural selection, mutation, migration, and drift, the four horsemen of evolution, if you will. Um, they tell you that genes are going to change within the species. And that mitigates against any permanency of subspecific groups. Race is also thought of as being a characteristic of individuals. Most Americans think individuals can be put into one race or another. Yet we've seen that if race is biological, can't be individual. Races are aggregates of deems. Deems are aggregates of people. Race is an aggregate, a statistical concept. Some individuals may be typical, if you will, of the nodes of a geographic group, but few are going to exhibit all of the traits considered typical because of this discordance of characteristics that formulate that are characteristic of populations. So even in biology, even outside of human consideration, biologists are finding that the concept of race isn't very useful. Similarly, races cannot be pure. Subspecific entities like deems or races are open genetic systems. Why didn't I think of that earlier? Um, genes make their way from deem to deem and across the range of a species, making the thought of purity and illusion. This ad from an alt-right website reflects the views that Europeans, or whites, are a pure race and need to expand their numbers and avoid mixing with other races. Well, I hate to tell them, but that horse has already left the stable. <laughs> uh, races never were pure, and they never will be. If you want to look at admixture, there's a really neat website that I discovered while writing this talk. Paintmychromosomes.com. It's really fun. Uh, you can look at the results of population movements over the planet in just the last couple thousand years as inferred from current genetic variation in sample populations across the country, across the planet. Admixture has been going on around the planet for a lot longer than just the last couple thousands of years. Homo sapiens is a very mobile species. Now the idea that races can be ranked, that some are superior or more advanced than others, is long-standing and he'll still hold sway among many citizens. What we know from evolution is that Homo sapiens sapiens, modern people like us, is a relatively recent species on this planet. Homo sapiens sapiens evolved from African populations only about 200,000 years ago. Round numbers. If you, you really believe the new Jebel Air Howard dates of 300,000, then you'd push it back. But, you know, we're going to argue about that. Mm -hmm. All modern geographical groups are descended from modern humans that moved out of Africa about 50 to 80,000 years ago. Genetic analysis shows that Africans are the most genetically varied, and all non-Africans descended from only a subset of African populations. They're much less varied. But what is especially significant about the genetics of humans is how remarkably similar we are to one another how little genetic variation there is among the geographical groups. 
Furthermore, comparing humans to chimps and gorillas show that all humans, whether African or non-African, are much more similar to one another than our subspecies of chimps. These are mitochondrial DNA data collected from a large number of humans, four subspecies of chimpanzees, and the bonobo. The shorter, the way you read this is the shorter the lines, the closer the genetic distance. Groups of modern humans have very short lines separating them, and chimpanzees have much longer lines. In fact, there's more variation within one subspecies of chimp than there is in the whole human species. What genetics and evolution tell us, then, is that human races are very recent and have not had much time to diverge. In fact, there's pretty good evidence that our species went through what is called the genetic bottleneck, that at one time the number of human beings on this planet shrunk down quickly uh, over a period of a few thousand years to a very small number, maybe only 10 or 20,000 people, which is not much, which means that all of us, regardless of where our ancestors came from. All of us are descended from a relatively small number founder population that then expanded to um, cover the earth, as they say in the paint ads. Human races are genetically so similar to one another, it's virtually impossible to tell us apart if all you had was a genetic scan. Finally, the most contentious point. Are races correlated with behavior? This is worth 15 weeks alone, much less the last couple of minutes of the talk. And apologies for not spending more time on a very important topic, but that's the way it is. Let me at least give you a couple of ways to think about this issue of race and behavior, because claims are made that simply are not, are not biologically warranted. Individuals, yes, differ in their intellectual ability. Raise your hand if you know somebody smarter than you are. Uh, okay. Notice I didn't say raise your hand if you know somebody dumber than you are because we were all much too, you know, we're all much too kind to say things. But yeah, individuals differ in their, in various central nervous system traits, if you will. But what characterizes an individual is not automatically scalable to a deem and certainly not scalable to a race. These are very different phenomena, and they are different statistically, biologically, and many other ways. Another way of thinking about race and behavior is that we know that behaviors are phenotypes. Phenotypes consist of the genes plus the environment. We know from the study of traits like stature that very large phenotypic changes can be brought about by environmental changes, and we know this is the case with behavioral phenotypes as well. The differences between American populations and average IQ test score, or in other intellectual tests, cannot be ascribed to differences in biological differences, given the huge environmental differences that already exist, and that we know exist from our living in the society that we do. What can we conclude then about the science and pseudoscience of race? Well, most of what people think about race is not supported by science and is based upon pre-scientific or pseudoscientific beliefs. These biological similarities have some ge geographic reality, but not in the sense of race as most people think of. Races as biological entities are not discrete or bounded groupings. Races as biological entities are not stable or permanent. Races and biological entities are not individual phenomena, but aggregate phenomena. Races as biological entities are not pure. Races as biological entities cannot be ranked, and races as biological entities do not have behavioral correlates. What then are we left with? Well, biological differences certainly occur. <clears throat> They occur between individuals and, in a limited sense, between some groups of individuals in different geographical areas. Only if you are sampling biological variation from geologically distant populations do these geographical differences appear. If you sample adjacent populations, the variation is continuous. Therefore, race, as most people think of the term, doesn't exist. So how should we think about race, then, if it's not a successful biological concept? Races definitely are real when it comes to American society and culture. The persistent socioeconomic differences 
among African Americans, whites, Latinos, Asian Americans, and American Indians have their roots in belief about the existence of race and its significance for everything from schooling to who gets hired for a job, who can marry whom, who can borrow money to start a business, to who gets to use government programs. Take a look at the history of the redlining of African Americans after the Second World War trying to buy a home on the GI Bill. Lots of examples of systematic bias to just about every component of our society. Race as a social construct is very real. And an issue that Americans need to deal with, I hope, better than we have in the last 400 years on this continent. So yes, we do need to collect census and other data using race as a variable, but everyone should be clear that we're not dealing with a real biological entity, but the nonetheless critical, important social one. And I would hope that we would work to dispel the pseudoscience associated with race, purity, superiority, and inferiority, stability, etc. Because again, in our society, such beliefs matter. Thank you for your attention. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Camp will take over. Jeannie will have.